Well, good morning. How many of you guys are Koopa PAAA regulator types? Oh. How many of you guys are industry types? Ah. How many of you guys are consultant types? Yeah, see, no one's going to cop to that. <laughs> All right, so we're going we're gonna to spend a couple hours or less. It'll just seem like a, more than that. We're going we're gonna to talk about reporting releases. And, you know, I've been doing th this particular one for a lot of years. We've changed it up a little bit this time. Uh, we have an awful lot of photo examples. You know, we're, we're going to run through the usual, you know, who do you have to call, what do you have to report, what do you have to say, you know, some of the other follow-on reporting stuff. But a lot of what we're going to go through this morning are examples about, you know, California's qualitative nature of reporting. Because there really is no, in many cases, no hard and fast answer, is this reportable or not. It kind of depends on what you can prove. You know, so as we go through this, you know, think about what is the worst that could happen if you report? That? When is that going to happen? Well, w when you report something and it's really big and you probably should have reported it and then you want this to happen. Or you report something and don't give a lot of detail so the people on the other end of the line are thinking, I have no idea what's going on at this facility so we're going to respond just in case. All right, so the more information that you provide, the less likely this will happen when it really doesn't need to happen. What about the black helicopters? See, that always happens. You just never know. How about, how about this poor guy? You know, a lot of people, I'm, I'm from the industrial world, right? I'm not a regulator. Uh, and, you know, back in my years with the real job working in industry, there was always a big concern. Well, if we report, you know, the news is going to get a hold of it, and then we're going to have to, you know, go through the news conference. You know. If your spill report generates that, reporting that spill was not your biggest problem, right? So don't let the fact that this may happen, you know, prevent you from reporting something that should have. You got bigger problems, you know, than this poor guy. How about this? And for you people in front, his eyes aren't even pointed in the right direction. You know, I got this guy living next door to me. I have no idea if that's related to reporting spills or not. Uh, bourbon will help you avoid this. About the community. You know, when are you going to get this kind of community response to your spill report? Well, is this the fifth spill report this month? You know, what kind of problems does your facility have? And I know I'm, I'm you know, I'm really trying to take a, I know there's a, there's a, there's a four-hour industry-focused spill and release reporting class. Gary Luck is doing that, I think, tomorrow afternoon. Uh, you know, Gary's a lawyer, so it's going to have a lot of legal, you know, ramifications and legal discussion there. But... The more that you work with your community, as a facility, the more that you are integrated into your community, the more that you work with and, dr and drill and train, you know, with your local fire department, the better of a community neighbor you are, the less likely this will happen should you have to report a spill. How about this? Is this going to happen when you report a spill? Will this happen when you don't report a spill? Yeah, see, so, yeah, there you go. All right, how about this? How about your attaboy? You know, really the, the problem with, and, and, and again, a lot of companies say, well, you know, I don't want to report a lot of spills. You know, well, if you have a lot of spills, that's your problem. It's not the report. You know, so you always want to look at how you're managing your hazardous materials. If you're always, if you're, you know, more frequently in a position to always have to figure out, gee, do I have to report this or not? You also ought to be really thinking about how do you avoid that situation to begin with? You know, because by the time you're trying to decide do you have to report a spill or not, You've already had a problem at your facility, right? So you really want to work on that. You know, how do you upgrade your facility? How do you upgrade your training? How do you look at your root causes? You know, how do you look at how you manage your hazardous material so that if you do have some kind of unfortunate event, it stays small. People are practiced to handle it as an incidental spill that may not need to be reported. All right, so, so keep that in mind. So we're going to go through some general stuff. Uh, we're going to talk about state reporting requirements and the unofficial guidance. And again, then we're going to go through a whole boatload of examples. Uh, then we're going to talk about, you know, who do you call, what do you say, some of the other related and unrelated California reporting requirements. We're going to go through then federal reporting requirements because they are different. And you don't want to forget about reporting to the feds. It's not just about California reporting. We're going to talk a little bit about local reporting tips and so forth. And you know, if you have questions, comments, additions, deletions, criticisms, corrections, just shout them out anytime. I can ignore them at 
any time. Right? Again, I'm not a regulator. I'm not a lawyer. I'm an evil, vile consultant. You want to know what I think? What would you like me to think? All right? <laughs> the, it's true. You, you guys watch, I think it's on Showtime, House of Lies. It, it's just like that. Although I don't have as big of a fun account. But, uh, you know, the, a lot of the stuff is our opinions. You know, there's really no black and white rule, right? So just kind of take that, take that, you know, to heart. And, you know, you don't want to think about, well, what's the worst get, that could happen if I report? Think about what's the worst that could happen if you don't report something that needed to be. It's always better to report stuff that maybe didn't need to be than not reporting stuff that probably should have been, right? But whatever you do, whether you report, whether you don't report, don't take too long. Again, I'm talking to facilities here. Don't take too long to make that decision. Right, I see a lot of people who have you know, hazardous material or contingency plans, and they do drills and exercises all the time. Usually involves you know, knocking something over filled with hopefully water, and you know, they go through the exercise of how do we respond, on and on and on. I don't see a lot of drills and exercises related to the non-obvious, do we need to report something? You know, we see a lot of these spill and release reporting talks given examples that are, that are ridiculously obvious. You know, well, we've spilled all this stuff in the river. Is that reportable or not? You know, we've gassed out the community. Do we need to report? Well, no, because there's nobody left to answer the phone. You, you, you know, drill and train on, you know, well, this 55-gallon drum of floor cleaner spilled on the floor. Is that reportable? Something that may take, you know, more, more, more than two seconds to figure out if it's reportable or not. Because you have a reporting clock that's ticking away. And you want to have your procedures in place to figure out, do we report or not? And if not, what kind of documentation should we have in place? Because there's a lot of stuff going on when an incident happens and you're trying to figure out, you know, what, what's the hazard assessment? What's the, what's the problem that we have? What's the initial problem? What's the problem going forward? Is it a release? Is it a threat and release? What kind of initial protective actions do we have to take? Do we need to get people right out of the area? Are we shutting down processes? You know, what about scene control and determining do we need to evacuate, how much? You know, while all this stuff is going on, don't forget, you know, you have some regulatory determinations that you need to make. So this needs to be part of your response. Now, if you're, you know, if you're pulling the plug, you're evacuating people, you're calling the outside responders, do you think that's reportable? Yeah. Right, so you don't really need to, you know, to make a whole lot of time to determine, but you still have to go through the reporting flow chart. But don't forget about this as part of your emergency response actions or your, or your initial determination actions. And, if, and, and for those of you who've been through this before or you're familiar with spill and release reporting, you know, sing, you know, sing, sing the, the, the Twilight Zone theme song now because when you look at all the different spill and release reporting requirements of all the different rules and regulations and statutes, federal and state, it gets kind of confusing, right? And, and no matter how much the state or how much the feds try and get down to single point reporting, there's still an awful lot of different statutes and different regulations that require or not require release reporting. And it's not just reporting of releases or spills, it's reporting of certain situations, right? Permit exceedances, right? Threatened releases. Stuff doesn't actually have to be released to trigger a release report or to trigger some kind of agency reporting within a certain period of time. How many of you folks receive hazardous materials as part of your facility operation? You know, trucks come in, they drop off boxes and drums, and all right, a lot of people, right? What happens if, you know, you get a box in, no hazmat markings, you open it up, bingo, there's hazmat inside. That requires a report to DOT, right? Because that's receipt of an undeclared hazardous material. Now, it's not a spill or a release but it does trigger DOT reporting within a certain period of time, right? So you want, we're, gonna, we're gonna hit that real quick, but you wanna be aware of these things and have some processes and procedures in place you know, to be able to do that. Uh, you know, we talk about hazard, and we're gonna go through too, but we talk about you know, hazardous material releases and if they're over a reportable quantity or if they pose a threat, right? Whether it's reportable or not. How about hazardous material releases during the course of transportation? Is there a reportable quantity for that? Is there a hazard-based exemption for that? Not at all. One drop potentially triggers a release report in the transportation world. 
whether it poses a hazard or not, whether it reaches any reportable quantity or not. Now, again, we're going to go through that, but there, it's not just calling about spills on site. All right, so you want to kind of keep that in mind. Uh, and again, there may be some multiple reporting requirements. There's a big difference between reporting federally and state. We're going to go through that. And a few facility folks, you know, don't forget about local issues and permit issues. There are some COOPAs that no matter what the state says with regard to reporting only if it poses a potential threat to health, safety, property, the environment, there are some local agencies that require anything to be reported as part of a permit condition or as part of their CalARP uh, program. Doesn't matter if it's considered a hazardous material release or not. Maybe as part of hooking or unhooking, uh, you know, part of a system, you know, you get a little bleed through a little burp that triggers, you know, the ammonia alarm or the chlorine alarm, even though it's routine, anticipated, not really a release. Some local agencies require as part of the CalArt program, that gets phoned in each and every time, even though it happens each and every time somebody connects. So you don't want to forget about that, you know, and have that integrated as part of your programs. Uh, remember, a situation doesn't have to pose a hazard to be reportable. We're going to go through a couple of those. And even if you don't report, you decide for whatever reason it's not reportable, you want to keep a record of it because you may have to prove it to somebody someday. Right? And, and you could have, you know, 20, 30 incidents over a period of time that are not reportable. You think maybe you want to keep a record of those and use those as part of your management process to figure out why you have so many incidents, minor though they are. You know, so kind of keep that in mind. And, and you could tell, you know, these are the guys that always have to report. It's that guy, not, not these guys. These are the facility maintenance guys who don't want to report anything. That's always the environmental person saying, no, no, you have to report. All right, real quick summary. In California, primarily hazard-based. People say, what's a reportable quantity? Well, depending, it really isn't one, right? It's primarily hazard-based. We're going to go through that. Uh, pretty much everything is reportable unless it doesn't pose a hazard. And we're going to talk about that. It tends to be, because of that, it tends to be a lot more subjective. And because it's subjective, it may take time to make that determination. And depending on how, on, on how much, I guess, how well documented or how defensible you want that determination to be, it may take a little bit more time than you're thinking. This is why you want to drill and practice. This is why you want to have certain procedures in place. You know, to be able to make that subjective determination in a timely fashion and document it appropriately because, again, somebody may challenge you on that. You know, and what's the worst that could happen if you're wrong in that determination? Fines, penalties, you know. And the more and the, more and the better documentation and supporting evidence you have, that will help mitigate that risk. If something is released off-site, do you think that's nearly always reportable? Yes. Yeah. Went through the fence line, but did it pose a hazard? It went through the fence line. Yeah, it posed a potential threat to the environment or to safety. Of course, that's reportable. In most, in, in pretty much every case, I try to think of it a couple of exceptions, and I couldn't really think of any that involve hazardous materials or hazardous substances. On-site releases, it's going to vary widely. An on-site release may be reportable. It may not be reportable. It, it, again, it depends on the, situ on the situation on the hazard, you know, and stuff like that. We're going to talk about a bunch of examples in this area. From a federal standpoint, primarily quantity-based. What's the reportable quantity? One pound, 10 pound, 100 pound, 1,000 pound, 5,000 pound of what chemical on what list, right? And there's various statutes that require, did it release into the environment? Did it go into a navigable waterway, right? So it's going to vary. Uh, because it's more quantitative, tends to be easier to determine, but in the federal reporting world, the reportable, even though you have essentially 15 minutes max to make your report, the reportable quantity, did we release over you know, 10 pounds in a reporting period? That reporting period tends to be 24 hours. So you may have a little bit more flexibility to calculate if you're not sure or, or not a reportable quantity has been released yet. We're, we may go through that a little bit later. If it's an off-site release, it, it's not necessarily always reportable because it depends on the quantity, depends on the environmental media that it goes into. We're going to hit that a little bit later. If it's an on-site release, you know, all things being equal, it tends to not be reportable. It depends, though, on where it's released, what environment did it release into. 
and is it considered the environment? You know, as everybody I'm sure here well knows, there's a lot of definitions in the rules and regulations and, and statute. And if it doesn't meet a definition, it doesn't meet the definition. And common sense may not have a lot to do with it. Right, so we're gonna, we're gonna talk more about that. That's, it's real conditional, but don't assume that just because you had something released, if it's on site, it may not be federally reportable. It has nothing to do with California, right? And, and just so you know, when you report anything to the California State Warning Center, who also gets that notice? National Response Center, so they're, they're gonna find out anyway. All right. Again, we, we already kind of me mentioned this, but you know, keep in mind, Cal because they're all, they're all uh, you know, required by different statutes and regulations, it tends to be more, more complicated in California just because of the nature of California's statute and, and regulations. And, and again, you're gonna see as we go through this. Uh, in terms of definitions, they're federally, there's a lot more definitions codified, not so much here in California. You know, and as you know, you know, trying to get something developed in a statute, it's like, as my wife says, it's like giving birth to a porcupine. It'll happen. Not as easy as you'd think, right? And, and, and we're gonna talk a little bit later about some of the guidance documents that are being developed. You know, from a regulatory standpoint, real hard to get something updated in the regulations these days. Uh, the, the federal reporting applicability, what hap what's the impact to the environment? Again, with certain definitions and exclusions. In California, the environment's just one aspect. And this is one problem that we typically see when we're counseling facilities, you know, and agencies too, is, well, you know, it got released, but it's not impacting the environment. Well, yeah, but you got a guy in a hazmat suit trying to clean it up. Well, yeah, we don't want his lungs to melt. Well, that's reportable. Well, it didn't hit the environment. Doesn't matter. Because in California, what are the four criteria? Does it pose a potential threat to Safety, health, property, and the environment. So it's not just the environment as opposed to threat to property. Yeah, my property values are going, eh, I don't think that's one of the criteria. Right? Does it pose a threat to property? Does it pose a threat to health? Does it pose a threat to safety? It's not just the environment. So these are some of the considerations that you have to make. Uh, federal reportable quantities tend to be quantitative. California, they're qualitative and subjective. Uh, in terms of what materials are regulated in the federal world, there tends to be a discrete list of them, though it's a pretty long list. California, pretty generic. What's a hazardous substance here in California? Sand. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> right? Yeah, sand. In the, in the wrong environment. Yeah, yeah. We, we talk about is sand reportable? Well, it could be a hazardous substance. Why is sand a has could be a hazardous substance? Why could sand impact the environment if you have a sand spill? What if, what, if it, what if it gets into a waterway and impacts that waterway and, may, and maybe the oxygen content? We're not, it's in a, we're not gonna talk about that. But it, it, it can get to that point. You know, is milk a reportable spill? Absolutely. Yeah. One, it's an oil, right? Well, it, it's not an absolute oil. But, but, but you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a vegetable or it's an animal oil, right? It can impact the BOD of the water. You know, it has, you know, has, a certain, has a certain BOD in it, right? So that potentially is reportable. Now, you can't cry over it, but you may have to report it. <laughs> you, you don't need to laugh at that. All right, uh, in terms of the notification point, the good news is typically there's two phone numbers, the State Warning Center and the National Response Center. There's a couple of others, but you know, for the most part, that's it. So, and I know, you know everybody laughs at this, but particularly for you facility folks, Think about your facility. Think about, you know, some spill that happens during the normal course of operation that, you know, the forklift folks, you know, knock something over, they scrape a drum, the drum leaks, and all that. I mean, just, this is kind of what people follow, right? I mean, this is kind of what they do. You know, I go through, you know, facilities all the time when I see, you know, crap on the ground and I see holes and it's like, oh, did you guys figure out if this is reportable or not? You know, and the, the environmental people look in big old eyes. It's the first time I've seen that. <laughs> There's a five-week-old newspaper, you know, soaking up the spill. 
right? I, you know, what kind of you know what kind of training do your third shift people have? Do your you know do your operations folks have? You know, what kind of do they get some kind of beat down? Do they get in trouble if they report to you, the environmental folks, or the EHS folks, if they've had a problem? You know, don't put all the weight of regulatory reporting on them. You know, you should have them report to you everything. Then you make the determination, right? And you want to look at, you know, was it, a, was it a process? Was it a procedure? That was an issue. And try not to get individual folks in trouble, or you're never going to find out what they've spilled. All right, so even though, yeah, that, 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 that's a pretty good joke poster, and I post this at all my clients, yeah, this is really what it is. You, you know, you kind of don't want, the ha want that to happen. All right, so bottom line here in California, under the Health and Safety Code 25507A, a handler, and a handler is pretty much most everybody at the facility, uh, upon discovery, must immediately report any, any, release or a threatened release of a hazardous material. Very broad, there's a couple of exceptions. Highway transportation of hazardous materials are exempt, but under the California Vehicle Code, it's all reportable, right? So you don't get a free ride there. It does reference conformance with Title 19 of the Cal Code of Regulations, 2703, C, uh, particularly in particular C, which we'll get to in the next slide. Uh, so you have to pretty much report everything, any release or threaten release of a hazardous material or hazardous substance. And if it's going to be reported, it goes to the CUPA, it goes to the California State Warning Center, 911 if necessary. Now before we go too far, for you CUPAs, right, if you're going to implement state law, state regulation as you do, and you're, you have facilities in your jurisdiction, you know, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, they have a spill, they think they need to report it, what phone number do they call? to report it to the CUPA. That's if your system requires reporting to 911, what if it's not an emergency? Call the inspection directly. Okay. Dispatch. All right. So basically I'm hearing a lot of different answers, which is fine. Have you thought about that? Right? There's all kinds of reportable releases that don't need to be reported to the 911 system. Right? So if you require, it's like, hey, uh, you report to 911, that gets to the Coupa. Really? You're going to have people call 911 for an oil spill on the concrete that they thought they need to report because opposed to threat to safety? You're going to have them call 911 for that? All right, so you need to consider that. All right, call the inspector. Well, what if the inspector doesn't answer and you get their cell phone? How, did that, how does that facility prove that they made the required notification? Do they just write it down on a log? Well, I called, I left a message. Where's your proof? I left a message. Right, what about off hours? We talked about this at, the LE, at one of the LEPC meetings. What about off hours? You know, maybe they call the Coupa office, which is only staffed during the day. Right, I know, I know one local agency, they have a part-time secretary who answers the phone two days a week. What happens if there's a spill any other time? How is that documented? Can they send you a fax? And they, at least they get the fax transmission report. So you Coopas and PAs, put yourself in the place of the reporting public out there and the reporting facilities. If they have to meet a regulatory <laughs> obligation to report to you, how do you allow them to prove that or document that, particularly off hours? You know, have you ever tried to call your own agency to make a spill report? You know, try it, middle of the night, see how it works. You know, give, give, give a nice assistance to the businesses, right? So that's. So that's that. And then the exemption or the exception, you know, in, in Title 19, we'll get to that in a second. Now remember, and we're going to we're going to cover this in, in more detail, but a release which is very broadly defined. You know, spilling, leaking, pouring, pumping, even abandoning, right? You know, you find some mystery container outside the front gate, ah, crap, it's abandoned. That may trigger a release report even though it's still in the drum. Right? Then there's potential or threatened releases, which is one of the subjective issues. Right, which is any condition that probably would be released or would result in an actual release if immediate action isn't taken. Well, think about that. You know, that, that can be kind of tough for a business to decide. You know, late last week, I, I was emailing to one of the, emailing back and forth to one of the Coopas, and they, they, they sent me a couple of pictures, and I didn't know if I could show the pictures or not, so I'm not going to. But one of their pictures at, at this older facility was a real tight close up shot of some old, ancient chemical containers, one of them is all kinds of fuzzy, 
and crusty on top. Is that a threat to release? Hell yeah. You know, you look at that wrong, like, like, have, you know, like mayhem. <sighs> Boom. That's a threatened release. Something that's shock sensitive. Yeah, that's something that I, would, I know I would advise my clients to call in. Right? And we're going to cover another, you know, some more examples, but it, it, it doesn't just have to be a release. So think about threatened releases. What kind of emergency conditions, what kind of acute conditions may be at the facility that may trigger a heads up call to one of the agencies? You know, to the Coupa and uh, the Calima Warning Center. You know, so think about that. It's not just if it's actually been released. Uh, and here's the exception in, in uh, 19 CCR 2703C. The immediate reporting of any release of a hazardous material hazardous substance, it's not required if there's a reasonable belief that it doesn't pose a significant present or potential threat or hazard to health, safety, property, the environment. So, if a facility is going to decide not to report, or if someone's going to decide not to report, do they have a reasonable, le reasonable belief that that release or threat release poses no present or potential hazard to health, safety, property, the environment? That's what has to be determined. That's what has to be decided. There's all kinds of spills and releases that are not reportable. But they're based on, but they're based on these, kind of, uh, these kind of situations. Yeah? In terms of definition of reasonable, it depends on the entity defining it, right? <coughs> so it could be, in other words, debatable. So when you buy me a cup of scotch later at the bar, and you say, you know what, get yeah, whatever you want, just be reasonable. It has that, that's that's the quantity, not the quality. <laughs> I'm just saying. So am I. So yeah, you're right. You know what what is re, what is a reasonable belief? I have no idea, right? That's why the more documentation that you have, you know, and we're, we're going to cover that in just a second. So, you know, th there is no regulatory criteria. There is no definition, right? Same thing for, th there is kind of a definition for threat and release, but it's still very subjective. You know, when you go back and look, you know, where it's likely to happen. What does that mean? A condition that might result. What does that mean? You know, a lot of it is in terms of what you can document. You know, reasonable people can disagree. And in this field, the basis for your disagreement may be what saves you from a violation. Or your lack of that base, or your lack of that determination or documentation May, may righteously get you a notice of violation, right? Same thing with posing, you know, potential hazard to health, safety, property, and the environment. There is no enforceable guidance on this. Now, there is guidance. Now, many of you guys are familiar with Cal EMA's little reporting booklet. I think the latest one's August 2010. It's good for what it is, and they have a lot of definitions in there, but they're regulatory definitions. Right? It's, it's very good guidance, but it's guidance based on facts, and it's guidance based on the statute. There's no, in, there's no real interpretation in there, you know, and, and you're not going to get interpretation because the legislative councils determined that if they were to put interpretation in there, that would be underground regulations. So you're not going to see it in there. So it's good for what it is, but it doesn't tell you what a reasonable belief is. It doesn't tell you what a threat to health, safety, property, the environment is. Now, there's a number of COOPAs, there's a number of administering agencies and, and care groups, community awareness and emergency response, like San, uh, uh, Santa Barbara County Care, has put together guidance documents, basically one to four pages. You know, here's what we think. Here's some examples. And they're great. They're still not enforceable. But they're better than nothing. But they're not enforceable. Right? But it's still better than nothing. And use them. And, and again, the, the, I, I've got a couple in there. I think I've, a lot of the ones from Southern California, you know, and, and Central California, I've thrown in the back of, of, one, of the, one of the handouts that you can download. Uh, the LEPC, Local Emergency Planning Committee, Region 1 Administering Agency Subcommittee, is developing sort of a collective interpretive guidance. You know, Fariba from LA County Health is, is spearheading that. You know, and, and, and it's not going to be enforceable, but it's better than nothing. All right, it's a lot better than nothing. And, and similar groups may be doing the same thing. 
But for you, the facility, or for anybody who's deciding, I'm not going to report this, you know, if you decide to report it, then the issue is moot. If you decide not to report it, what's your documentation? What, what's, your, what's your opinion? All right? I mean, we, yeah, you, we all know what opinions are like. Everybody has one, and they all say. All right. So if you're not going to report, you, you want to make sure that there's a relatively rapid process to develop your reasoning. Why do you think it doesn't pose a present or potential threat to health, safety, property, the environment? Right? What's your proof? What's your data? You know, critically review it. Have somebody, you yeah, know, okay, uh, yeah, that, that's reasonable. Let's stick with that. That's the story I'm going with. Right? And then document it. Now, we're talking about having published studies. We're not necessarily talking about, you know, go to the lab report. Because you may have to make that determination in a fairly short amount of time, you know, but between no time and 15 minutes, you know, if that. Right? But what's your basis? I mean, for the most part, where you're thinking, I don't think it's reportable. Is it? Is it not? We're not talking about the obvious high hazard stuff. We're not talking about, well, there's a chlorine release off gassing from the pipe. You're not going to be going through this. You're going to be reporting it, right? You know, somebody dissolves in the spill. You're going to be reporting it. Your place is on fire. You're going to be reporting it, right? Somebody is exposed and they're going to the hospital. You're going to be reporting it. Something goes down the storm drain. You're going to be reporting it, right? Something goes into the dirt. It goes into a hole, right? You're going to be reporting it. If you have to evacuate half of your facility, you're going to be reporting it. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about stuff that may spill into containment, something that's relatively small and it's just static sitting there in a room and maybe you get the people out of the room so you can get to it. But it's low hazard stuff. That's what we're talking about. All right, so those are really, and you want to practice that stuff. You know, why do you believe? And you know, you're, you're, going, to go, you're going to go everything from, you know, you've done sampling, you have lab testing, you have animal studies, You've published a peer review report in the, in the journal of spill reporting journal, right? Which nobody has. All the way to your wild ass gas or you pull it out of your, you pull it out of the air, right? You want, you know, you're not gonna, you're never gonna be over here. You kind of don't want to be over here either. You want to be somewhere in the middle, eh, more towards the green side, but you want to be somewhere in the middle, right? What's your basis? If you had to prove to somebody, or if you had to try and convince somebody. That's what you want to do, right? So let's go through some examples. Now these I've pulled, a lot of these I've pulled from the various agency you know, guidance documents, right? And some I've made up. But for example, what's more likely to be reportable? A release of a hazardous patrol that results in a fatality, exposure, or other injury. Anybody question that? No, reportable, right? Actual threat to health or safety. If something is an airborne release and wafts over the fence line, is that reportable? Why? Potential threat to the environment, right? A release that, that results in a facility evacuation. Why is that reportable? But sh potential threat to health or safety. If it didn't pose a potential threat to health or safety, why did you evacuate? Yes, sir? I just have one word I think you're missing there. Significant. A significant release? Yes. What if you had an insignificant release, but you still evacuated your facility? I know what the code says, and you're right. A signi but in terms of what do you consider significant? Again, it is. It is a gray area, but these are examples. Now, let, let's use this as an example. Let's say you had a release. Something got released. Whether you're sure of what it is or not, and it's like, you know what? I get to evacuate everybody out of the lab because I'm not really sure what the hazard is but I'm evacuating people out of the lab. Why did you evacuate people out of the lab? Because you thought there was a potential threat to health or safety, right? That makes it reportable. Because if it was insignificant, you wouldn't have to evacuate. Now, if you're trying to say, well, look, I got everybody out of the lab, just so I can go in there and figure out what the hazard is, all right, I'll buy that. You know, then if you say, you know what, it's fine, everybody back in, it's not significant, fine, not reportable. What's the timing in that? If it takes you an hour to figure it out, you really should have reported it as at least a threat and release that poses a threat. All right? And if you're clear on what you're reporting, it's not like, again, the black helicopters are going to show up, every hazmat team in the nation is not going to show up. 
you know, but it's that term significant. What's that based on? These are examples. Now, you've ca who called the fire department? Then you might as well report it because you've already made the phone call. So they didn't report it to the Coupa, they just reported it to the fire department. Yeah, but you, you know what though, for, for a retail establishment like that, it can be anything from a gas leak to the, that unwashed customer that you can never get rid of. <laughs> you know, now, if it's, now if, it, if, if it's really strong over in the pool chlorine aisle, you know, yeah, they should have called the Coupa. Then it's up to you, the Cuba, to determine, you know, are we going to get them on that or not? Is that, is, you know, my, my, you know, my guidance to anybody is, if you're calling the fire department, make those two extra phone calls. If you're already calling the fire department, clearly something. Po now, whether it's a hazardous materials release or not, you don't know. But if if you're thinking, yeah, you know what, I think it is, then call, then make the notification. Particularly if I already called the fire department, because it poses a potential threat, or you wouldn't have called the fire department. How about a release that you can't immediately mitigate? You know, in other words, it's like we're, we're not going to be able to get to it. Like, for example, one of my clients, they have 35 percent uh, 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 brain freeze, nasty nitrogen compound oxidizer. No, worse than that, hydrazine, Red Bull. Oh. They have 35% hydro, hydrazine. They had a release, went in, in, inside the containment that that, hydro lease con, that that hydrazine container was in. Like, you know what? I don't want our facility people, they said, oh, they don't want their facility people cleaning it up. Not at 35%. That's a nasty chemical. So they called their hazardous material hazardous waste contractor to come in to clean it up out of the secondary containment. Would that have been reportable? Yes. Yeah. I think. Why, why do they call their contractor? Because it posed a potential threat to health or safety. Doesn't matter. Well, we didn't pose a threat to anybody outside the facility. It's not part of the determination, right? So, you know, if they said, "Well, we're doing it because our guys, their union says they don't have the classification for it, and you don't pay overtime, so you got to find somebody else to do it," and yeah, then maybe it's not reportable. See? And look, I know it's. I know. I know. We went through that with them. All right. A release that requires use of respiratory protection for mitigation. Eh, more than likely, that could probably be reportable because you're trying to protect somebody's health. Right? A release where emergency response personnel are called. Yeah, that's reportable. And again, these are, these are examples. These are my opinion. These are some other agency's opinion. Right? If you can make the case for, hey, we had a release, we called emergency personnel, but for these reasons, we didn't think it's reportable. Good for you. Make sure you document it well, because that's going to be questioned. Small controlled spill that doesn't leave the facility can be cleaned up by area people, by the maintenance folks in the area, but they need to upgrade their personal protection. They normally wear safety glasses and gloves, but to take care of this spill, they're putting on a Tyvek suit and a respirator. You know, poses a potential threat to safety or health. Going to be reportable. Now, just because something's reported, doesn't mean you're asking for an emergency response, does it? You know, you're, you're reporting and saying, hey, yeah, here's what we're doing. We're cleaning it up. We have guys. We're trained in how to do this, but we want to make sure we get the report in. And you call OES and you call the, or you call CalEMA and you call the local agency and you get the reporting control log number. All right? And if the facility works well with the local agency and they're trusted, you're probably not going to see that prophylactic emergency response. Because the agency's going, yeah, yeah, we work with these guys. We know that they're trustable, you know. Threat and release with a facility where they've had to activate the <laughs> contingency plan, right? They put on the vest. They put on the hard hat with the blinking light, you know, more than just hazard. You know, eh, it's probably reportable. You know, you could argue about it. Pretty much anything that's over some RQ for some highly regulated compound, it's probably reportable. Unless you have, it's like, look, we're, we're just near the reportable quantity, and for these reasons, it's not, you know, if it's on some other regulatory list, it's a regulated substance, it's a highly hazardous chemical, it's an extremely hazardous waste, 
more than not, it's going to be reportable if it gets out of the container. You know, maybe, maybe not, but more, more than likely it is. <clears throat> or anything that's federally reportable, report it in California. Stuff that may be insignificant, or, ins or yeah, insignificant that's not reportable. You know, maintenance stuff, you're normally doing stuff, you expect small incidental releases, the maintenance folks, or the people who are operating, ah, and that's we spilled again, they grab a pad, they swab it up, and they're good to go. It's incidental, doesn't pose any more significant health or safety threat than the stuff that they normally do. They're not wearing any additional personal protection equipment to mitigate that incidental spill. Probably not reportable. <clears throat> Low hazard stuff stays within the facility boundary. You know, you know somebody, somebody whacks a, a drum of oil with a forklift and you get, you know, it's kind of leaking out. So they turn the drum over and they grab some oil pads, you know, and it's like, yeah, look, it, it's relatively small. It's not leaving the concrete floor. You know, we handle oil all the time. You know, we're just going to go clean this thing up. It's not a big, fat, huge spill. It's not flammable. Probably not going to be reportable. But again, you still want to make the case for that. Stuff released in a secondary containment that's designed to hold it and contain it. And you can clean it up within a reasonable, <laughs> there you go, reasonable, within a reasonable amount of time. The containment's designed for that. We're going to see some photo examples. In-plant spill, readily controllable or neutralized by non-emergency personnel. Again, without requiring anything more than the usual personal protection equipment that they wear, and you're not evacuating the area. Probably not reportable. You know, reasonable people can disagree, but that's more, more non-reportable than, than, than reportable. Uh, uh, stuff's in the immediate spill area. It doesn't go down any hole. doesn't go into the dirt. It stays on property, relatively low hazard stuff. These are examples. All right, let's see some photo examples. <laughs> I finally got this guy to move away from the front of my house. It's a kidnap van is what that is. All right, facility, very, very well-designed acid storage facility. This thing is designed to hold and store sulfuric acid. The secondary containment is coated with a good acid-resistant coating. Everything is all acid-resistant construction. They have, let's say these guys have a release of sulfuric acid into this containment that's designed and maintained to hold sulfuric acid. Well, you know, it's got a nice coating on it or a liner in it. Everything's integral, you know. It's all maintained in good shape, right? The people who work out in this acid facility, they normally wear acid gear. And it leaks in a secondary containment, you know, and it's not the entire tank leaking, but it's, you know, some amount in there. And they're like, all right, well, let's shut off the valves and in our normal protective equipment, let's pump it into the spare tank. Reportable or not? Which way are you waving? Reportable? Depends if you're in Contra Costa County. <laughs> well, there are, see, there are some, okay, well, and, and what would be the reason for that? And is that in regulation? Okay, so that's guidance. So if they say, hey, it doesn't meet the state requirement, right. may not meet your guidance, guidance, which is still guidance. Right. Now, if it's part of their CalARP document, but keep in mind, if it's just guidance, now if they can say, look, a person say, well, you know, here's why we didn't think it was reportable. You know, certainly that's a much better discussion when you're trying to decide should they have or shouldn't they have. They say, well, why didn't you report it? Well, I, well I, uh, 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 a battery died on the phone. Uh, I didn't have the app on the phone. Uh, you know, I thought you did it. You know, better discussion. But if that thing is designed to hold that, where is it going? It's not going into the environment, right? If they're normally cleaning it up with the proper equipment, you know, but again, these are examples. Nothing's a hard and fast rule. But what, you know, and again, very nicely designed containment that's well maintained, right? It's not bare concrete, right? More than likely to spill into there, all things being considered. Is it going into the environment? Probably not. Uh, what if that's what the containment looks like? <sighs> Meh. Yeah, you know, that containment's not going to be containing much. You know, maybe that'll keep a person from going through it if they fall on it, but. That would be reportable because it was secondary containment not designed for primary containment. Yeah, it's a secondary containment that's just not being maintained. However you want to word it, 
and there and there have been some there is some case, federal case law you know you spill stuff into here and that's designed to contain it that's not a release into the environment you spill something here yeah, that's into the environment that's potentially into the environment because that containment's not integral right uh, or containment that you know maybe could have been better joined up at the at the hip you know that's not containing anything that doesn't e if that doesn't even keep the rats out right uh, what if it's fuming sulfuric acid then it's going into the atmosphere right is that a potential is that a release into the is that a threat to the environment yeah so even though it may be in beautiful secondary containment if it's fuming and getting into the air you know California that's more than likely reportable you know sodium hypochlorite released into this beautiful secondary containment you know strong bleach not really going to go anywhere right spills over to the gravel into the environment you know what's it designed to hold again all things being equal somebody goes to clean it up out of the secondary containment they got to put on the protective equipment that they don't normally wear handling the material more than likely reportable in my opinion reportable or not do you think yeah probably why Any kind of spill of a potential flammable liquid, right? What's burning the liquid or the vapor when this stuff burns? It's the vapor, so it's evaporating. Is that a potential threat to property, the safety, the fact that you have an evaporating flammable liquid? Yeah, that is probably reportable. How about a spill out here while they're loading whatever the heck this is? Now, what if it goes onto the concrete that, and it's not, you know, what's the difference between that concrete and that concrete. According to the EPA case law, federal case law, that is designed and constructed to serve as secondary containment. That is not. So that would be considered into the environment, essentially. Right? How about that? What, what else is it? My, my question would be, is that exclusively used for containment? No, they have multiple functions. I would probably report it. My advice would be to report it. Just because it's not isolated containment poses a potential threat. You know? How about that lovely drum of perchloroethylene in secondary containment? <laughs> There's, a There's the liquid level. Yeah, th that, well, this holds the complete volume of this drum. But now you, have, now you have a volatile, you know, carcinogenic liquid that somebody has to pour into some other container. Do you think that poses a potential threat to safety or health? Yeah, I'd report this, even though it's not going anywhere. And I'd say, yeah, we had a drum. It, 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 you know, it's a volatile material. It poses a health hazard. It was released in a secondary containment. And our folks are masking up, and they're taking care of it. I just want to get the report in, get the log number, and you're done. No emergency response needed, not a 911 call. But to me, this poses a potential significant threat to safety or health. If it didn't, why are they wearing a respirator when they don't normally handling this material in the volumes that they normally handle? Beautiful secondary containment buildings. You have a spill of, again, within reason, something relatively non-volatile, non-flammable, Something spilled, and you know, the inside of these things, they all have beautiful secondary containment, right? Something spills inside of here that the work, ah, nuts, you know, they pull the floor and they swab it up. Likely, all things being equal, more or less reportable. Less reportable. They dump the barrel loading it in here and it falls out here on the drain. Reportable, right. <laughs> it spilled milk. That's not milk. Kind of depends what it is. That, what do you think the condition of the floor is? I'm surprised people are able to stand there without falling through the subfloor, right? Probably not as integral as you like, more or less reportable. Probably more just because of the condition of the floor and the size of the spill. Now, if this were, you know, just some kind of aqueous-based cutting fluid with, you know, vegetable-based food-grade cutting <laughs> fluid, 
you know, people get bathed in it, it's not going to be a big deal. Eh, maybe not reportable, right? But you're going to want to get all that kind of information. Uh, acid tank, even no matter how good that containment is, does this pose a potential threat? Why? For those of you nodding, why? Well, look at the big ass hole in the tank. What are you going to do? You're going to stick your finger in there while you're swabbing up the spill so it doesn't suddenly burst through? Right? You know, I, yeah, I'm reporting this. APSA says nothing, pal, under 10,000 gallons. Oh, okay. <laughs> besides, that's not, besides, even if a word, this is not a release into the navigable water. Right? So, mineral oil, non PCB. How do you but, typically but, get to a navigable waterway? I mean, how many thousands of gallons is that? How many aggregate gallons are we talking about at that substation? How much actually was released is what the question is in terms of reporting. I, you know, we don't have to decide whether it is or not, but these are examples, right? So you hear, again, a lot of these classes where we talk about, oh, yeah, you know, something reached the river or it went down the storm drain or five, people, five people's lungs came out their nose, you know, is that reportable? Obviously it is. This is what you see day in, day out. You know, question here is what, what's the fluid? What's under that gravel? How long has it been there? Is it readily biodegradable? Where is the water, the groundwater? For this utility, they had a pretty extensive study done because they have transformers blow up all the time in the summer. I mean, those things pop off like popcorn at a movie theater, right? And they had a pretty extensive study done for mineral oil, how much and what different kind of soils would be reportable. Otherwise, they'd be reporting thousands of things a day in the summertime. Right, so you could, based on that, they're like, nah, you know what, as long, you know, we could dig down, if that thing's less than a couple of feet deep, eh, it's not gonna be reportable, or at some of their other facilities, because of where groundwater is, this isn't reportable. It, it just, it's a nuisance. Now, a strict reading of the water code where this will or may probably pass into waters of the state, you know, but if you're, an electric, if you're a utility, and you have a bunch of big old hanging transformers, that may be old and may tend to weep a little bit. And when you see a bigger picture of this, there's all kinds of oil, you know, weeping out of the top. Why do you have to make the first decision when you see this? You know, that's part of planning. Well, what happens if we do have a release? What will we report? What's our policy with this material? You know, may, maybe, you're a, uh, maybe you're a railroad, right? And, and you have a lot of different, you know, activities where you're doing, you know, fueling along sidings. You know, you're gonna have spills. How much has to be reported? Plan for that ahead of time. Don't wait for this to happen. Yeah. Okay, well, just what you're saying, like, this sort of thing can be common. Yeah. I've been, you know, heard your talk about California, we don't have quantities. I've actually, so in your presentation, the guys in the plants were doing training. When it's all said and done, I go, Steve, how many gallons that reaches the dirt do I have to report? So when you just said, come up with a policy, can you take a look at something, you know, a situation like this, and you go, all right, here's where we are from the creek. Let's just come up with the 10 gallons or 5 gallons gets on the dirt. Probably could. Yeah. And, and I've done this for, for a lot of my clients. I have, for their particular materials, I've sat down. I was like, okay, but for Zardox 50, if 32 gallons gets out of this area, you need to make this phone call. You know, and they've elected to do that. Now, for the plant, like, for example, in this, in this kind of example, I have the plant guys call me and tell me, you know, if I were working at a facility, call me and tell me. That way they don't have to worry about does it pose a threat or not. They're like, Hey, we've got this weeping transformer. Come over here and take a look at it. And then you, with more, with more specific knowledge of, yeah, you know what? We have these gravel beds. You know, groundwater's, you know, 100 feet deep. This stuff is not getting to groundwater based on the soils that I know that we have. And you make your decision. Well, we just need to clean that up. You know, that's not going to be reportable. Then you're fine. Yeah. Of concrete, and now you're asked to defend it. You can't. Well, but but again, you know, in, in in stuff like this that that two people can one's reportable, one's not. You know, you're 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 
you still have your, even if they can't get a hold of you to tell you. Hopefully if you have, for example, electrical equipment like this that leaks and weeps, you know, you already know, look, unless it's some kind of big, huge spill, we're not going to be reporting this stuff. We do need to mitigate it, but we're not going to report it. We've already made these determinations. But you still want the folks to call you and tell you. You know, if they can't get a hold of somebody within two or three phone calls, you have bigger issues than this. I think one thing to add to this uh, slide is that that gravel is a form of secondary containment. And if you notice that piece of equipment leaking, you probably want to put a spill pad or something up under there. And then over time, you get that into some type of maintenance in which they fix that transformer, and you won't have continuing leaking of that transformer. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, the, 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 the problem that I see, and the, the, for this example, the problem that I see really isn't the reporting aspect. It's when are you going to fix that? How often are you going to clean that? Is that a leak that happened last year? Guy goes, oh, no, it's, it's been like that for 20 years. Well, clean it. You mean you've been looking at this for 20 years and you haven't dug up the dirt yet? Yeah, I mean, that, that's the bigger issue. Is, and, and if you see the bigger transformer, I mean, this thing weeps all the time. They're not going to be able to fix this entire thing because they have to pull, you know, a mainline transformer out of service to fix it. They're not going to do it until this thing blows up. Fine, clean this thing off. But in terms of spill and release reporting, from a management aspect, my bigger issue is keep this thing clean so you can see if it's active leaking. Get this thing cleaned up. If this is old-time historic leaking, clean it up. Then you don't worry about it anymore. You can't. You, right. Many times you can't. Yeah. You just can't. And if they don't like it, they can move out of California where they do have numbers. That's what it is. It's hazard-based. You, you can't give them a number. And I tell you, because it's funny, because we get when we do plant training, it's really funny, because we tell people, oh, yeah, you know, you get a little bit of oil in there. We can report every drop of oil. Da, 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 da. You know, this is okay. This is not a problem. On and on and on. It's like, tell you what, I get one of my old cars. I park it in your driveway. How many drops of oil can I put in your driveway? None. You know, why not? How many, you know, how much is okay? Kind of depends on the situation. Many times you cannot give them a number. You just can't. You know, and if you give them a number, every spill they're going to report to you is just under that number. Uh, non reportable? Yeah, they're flaring it off. What about that? That's worse to Shershire, Shershire sauce. What if that's some kind of lab chemical? Well, it depends. Is that what's left of the lab researcher? <laughs> Situation based. What if that were a bottle of my fabulous 18 year old Yamazaki scotch? It's cryable. What about that? It's what happens when you hang a corner too close and you kind of poke a hole in your tanker. What makes this reportable? This guy standing here foaming down the guy cleaning it up. That's what makes it a potential threat. Well, but it hasn't gone through the hole yet into the creek, but we did this to the creek anyway. Is that reportable? Potential threat, right? Oh, no, I'm not going to get paid. Why would this be reportable? It doesn't matter. He's it's got it's got a plague. Actually, that's that's aqueous ammonia. In my APSA class, I tell people that's oil. Doesn't matter. It's released. It's not in. It's a good example. It's not in containment. This guy got soaked down. Uh, that's reportable. What about food grade products? Depends where it goes. And it depends what it is. Some food grade products are regulated like an oil, like ev like anything else. You know, and if it if it gets into a drain, if it gets into a waterway, it's going to be reportable. If this were, you know, vegetable oil, you know, and this guy got soaked down, if he has to use a safety shower and eye wash, it doesn't matter if it's vegetable oil or not. It poses a threat to safety or health. How about that? If there is one. Actually, these are EPA people. This is an old EPA slide. I, you know what? You could probably make a case either way. You know, if it didn't pose a threat, they'd, uh, you know. Depends I, where the drain goes. And it depends where the drain goes. If that's a dead sump, eh. 
you know, if that went to a sewer district, probably, you know. Again, the bigger problem is how come these people aren't suited up and they're on the down slope of the loading dock? Right, what about that? It's in secondary containment, but what if that were, uh, what if that were just light mineral oil? I don't know. What if it were gasoline? Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. Secondary containment leak sensor showing a leak of waste oil into the secondary containment space. Potential threat to health, safety, property, the environment? My opinion, no. Is it recordable? Yes. Not reportable? I wouldn't report that. I would report the guy who installed that because this tank is actually empty and it's showing a leak. So that's... <laughs> Some, somebody uses the uh, Cornetta de Emergencia. <laughs> is, th is this an okay s r emergency alarm? Yeah, if everyone knows what the, what the horn means, sure it is. Y you bet it is. Yeah, well, people shout at this facility all the time because they're always mad. But that's what the horn means, right? I think, e you know, there's a problem here. E you know, people have to get out of the area. Potentially, but at least take some time to find out what it is. But this is one indication there's a potential threat, right? So again, part of the procedure should be, you know, kind of quickly find out what the deal is so you can make a proper reporting determination. Well, we got to the storm drain kind of in time. Anything go, you know, anything besides water that goes down the hole? More than likely it is, but it depends. But more than likely. You know, what if it were just, you know, the normal parking lot ooze, you know, the normal everyday sheeny ooze from the parking areas that get into the storm drain? Is that a reportable spill or a release? Is it a release? Probably not reportable like we've been talking. If you see it, do you need to document it and report it to the water board as part of your annual stormwater compliance reporting? Yeah. Bless you. Yes, you do. So it's still an event that needs to be documented. Yeah? What about those of us who actually have secondary containment for our storm drains because we want to prevent the parking lot from going out? Then it is not <laughs> entering the environment. So like a safe drain, stop by John Baraja's safe drain booth tomorrow and buy as many of those as you can possibly carry. Those are very good. Right? So you don't have to do this. Right? It's already in there and you keep it closed. That's your containment. That's not getting out into the environment. That is getting out into the environment, right? That may be reportable. You know, federally, would this be reportable if this is released from your facility? Yeah, that's a navigable water release. It's enough to cause a sheen. There's your sheen. That's reportable. What's underneath that little sump right there? Contaminated groundwater, right? That's not lined. Reportable? Y yeah. It's going into the environment. You know, if you have to suit up anything different than what you normally wear, this guy is like, it's not reportable. <laughs> then, then maybe it's not. All right, but you know, it depends what kind of level of protection you have to wear, you know, trying to put that thing together. Your leak alert, your leak alarm goes off, and you're not really able to confirm whether there's a release out of the tank or not, it tends to be more reportable because it's a potential threat. How about anything leaking into this crap-ass secondary containment? Well, the molecules are really big, so they can't get through the crack. Well, it didn't get through the containment because it all just oozed up onto the side of the tank. That's not oil. That's a burn mark. Well, some big, again, you know, situations, right? You know, you have to get people, you know, something that's this big, very likely you're going to be reporting it. Again, you may not need an emergency response, but again, they're all situations. And if you're saying, yeah, it's not, no, I don't agree with them, that's fine. But again, what's your basis? Because you may need to have that documented and proved. Uh, go, it's going into secondary containment, but I don't know if this chemical shrinks when it hits the undersized secondary containment, but it's not on big enough secondary containment, you know. That, that's a 16-gallon spill pallet. 
in a 270 gallon tote. Flammable liquids get released. But we have wood. Well, no, that's more than likely reportable. Yeah, flammable liquid. Well, if somebody walks by, they could slip. That's a potential threat to safety. If this were me, I don't think I'd report this. Unless this thing oozes out here to the gravel, then I, it depends what kind of oil it is. What about sites where it's beyond your control? If someone else is driving on, they have a spill, you know, a delivery truck. That's a good question. Now we're going to talk. We're, we're going to get to DOT in just a second. I'm going to start. That's reportable, All right? So we're going to start going through that. But <laughs> if if, so, if somebody else shows up, like your vendor shows up, they're offloading and all that stuff. A couple of considerations. They, the vendor, they, the truck operator, they, the shipper, right, or the carrier. They have a DOT reporting obligation, but the fact that they're on your property, you, you the property owner operator, have a reporting obligation because it is on your property. Like, like the airport where ASIG comes up and right. fuels the plane right. for uh, American Airlines, or right. American Airlines and they spill 50 gallons, and ASIG's like, that's not reportable, and United may say, oh, it's reportable to us. Then, so United, should, then United should report that. And then have a serious discussion with, you know, the refueling guys to say, "What? Come on, it's Jet A." It happens all the time. I know it happens all the time, and they they don't want to report it, you know. Anyway, so when you make your determination, right? Remember, it, it's relatively immediate. So again, this is why you want to have procedures in place and address these issues ahead of time. Yeah. Let's say I'm FedEx. I'm delivering a package to a warehouse, and I'm in the process of delivery, and the package. We're, we're going to get to that. that. That's reportable on both ends. That's a, that's a transportation reportable. We'll get to that. Anyway, so you have to report all the time. Now, if you say, well, look, I couldn't report because that would impede my emergency response. Yeah, that's okay. But in this day and age, everybody and their brother's got a cell phone. It's all, it, there's no reason to wait. Uh, so, but if there's one guy at the facility and he has to report, but he has to go change his shorts because his bomb fell off the forklift, that's okay. <laughs> Who lost their job today? Right? Who has to notify? Basically, a lot of folks. Me, the outside consultant, I don't have to report unless I'm actually handling the stuff. But pretty much everybody has to report. And then there's some others that we're going to get to. Remember, you notify the COOPA, the local agency, the administering agency, the Calima Warning Center, if it's federally reportable, the National Response Center. Then depending on the agency, bless you, depending on the agency and the permits and all that stuff, you may have to report to them. One thing I would say is use caution for you facilities if you're using the agency guidance documents. Some of the newer ones are much more comprehensive. Some of the older ones simply give you a quick and simple call Calima reference. And people think that's all I have to do. Remember, there's federal reporting as well, right? So don't just rely on what the agency tells you. I know everybody could read this. This is a copy of uh, Riverside County's two-page guidance which is very, very good. There's a lot of other agencies that have them. Check with your local agency. Check with your COOPA. They may have these too. The, great guidance. They really give you a lot more insight. All right, so you call the California State Warning Center. When, it, when the call goes into the warning center, they notify everybody else. They used to do it by fax. Now they do it by email. <clears throat> All right? They report to everybody. So if you're like, well, I'll report to the state, but I don't want to tell the feds, the feds are going to know. Right? But what, let's say there's a local reporting obligation. Let's say you also have to report to the sewer agency or you also have to report to the, to the, to the uh, storm sewer guys. You the, you, the facility, still need to make that report, even though the state will put them on the call down tree, because you, the facility, still have that, re that reporting obligation. The more information you tell them, the better it's going to be. If you don't know, say, I will call you back, get that control number, call back and say, OK, for this release, I just reported this information. I have updated information. You know, and so in your emergency plans, you know this is the kind of information that you want to collect. So plan for that as part of your release activities. How do you get this information? <clears throat> and, and you know, you can go to the Calima's uh, website under spill and release report, and you can see year after year after year, county specific, city specific, who's reported what. You can kind of see the information that's in there. All right, so they report something, you know, different spills. You look at the detail. They, they, you know, they reported this kind of spill or we found this on site, but then they called up later and updated the information. <coughs> Excuse me, it chokes me up when I see this. So 
that, you know, if you want to see, well, what kind of information is out there when a report gets filed, go to the RIMS Release Information Management System, and you can see. You know, you can see for those of you agencies who are doing area plans, you can get information for your jurisdiction, what kind of spills have been reported to Calima in the last one year, three year, five year, 10 year, whatever the period is. That may give you an idea of what you should focus on planning for, the actual releases that you have. Right, so that's some good information there. <clears throat> and remember, there's other reports that may have to be made, release from an underground storage tank system, depending on whether it's cleaned up within a day, depending on whether it could be verified as a release in a secondary containment or not, may have some reporting obligations. Anything spills on the highway is exempt from that health and safety code reporting, but under the California Vehicle Code, any amount is reportable. There's no reportable quantity exception. There's no hazard exception. Remember, what are the only two things in California that could go off of a truck? What kind of, okay, water. What kind of water? Basically clean, you know, clean water. And what kind of chicken feathers? From what kind of chicken? What kind of poultry? No. <laughs> Live chickens. That's it. Everything else is reportable. You got a truck driving down the street, a couple of drops of not water, doing, doing, that's reportable. And the driver needs to report that. All right, so, that, so that, that's reportable. And then there's a written report to the Highway Patrol within 30 days, and they have to get that <clears throat> back to Calium or OES, and there's a written report form. Yeah? Yeah, 42 gallons of vehicle fluid. Yeah, so I mean, there, there's a difference between reporting and response, right? Now, if you're in the transportation business, you need to be aware of the transportation release requirements, right? For, for example, spills from, a ra you know, from uh, railroads, you know, you need to know what jurisdictions are along your route because you may need to report to that jurisdiction as you're passing through. And hopefully you've stopped the leak before you pass through, right? Same thing with transportation. Right, facilities who are involved, who do their own transportation or transportation operations, they need to be very aware of this reporting. That's part of the vehicle checks. You know, you, you know, that's one of the things that they check when you go into a way station. If you're leaking, you have a release report. You can't just say, "Well, it's not that bad." You got to report uh, discharges of sewage, basically any kind of discharge into waters of the state or areas where it could pass into waters of the state, essentially ground spills. <clears throat> depends how much is released. Anything that exceeds a federal reportable quantity, it's going to be reportable. Sewage over a thousand gallons, it's going to be reportable. All right, and that's reported to Cal Lima and the Coupa. You know, no different than the other hazard. But remember, these are in different sections of the regulations. California Water Code and the water regulations in 23. It's not just Cal Lima's regulations. There are others. Very similar, kind of all reportable, right? In terms of discharging oil to marine waters or non-marine waters, statutorily there's a 42 gallon limit, one barrel limit. It's a lot of oil, except if there's a more except if there's a more stringent requirement in the California Oil Spill Contingency Plan, and there is. What's that amount? Any. Similar to the feds, if it costs us a sheen, you have to make the phone call. Right. Remember your APSA reporting. By the time you reach that APSA reporting for 42 gallons in the state waters, you're well past all of the other one drop getting out to the environment reporting. Keep that in mind. Then there's some others for pipelines and crude oil discharges. Don't forget about the feds. For you agency folks, and I know we're still gonna cover feds, but we'll be out on time. For you agency folks, <clears throat> and this should be part of your hazardous material area plans. For your CalARP facilities in your jurisdiction, what if there's been uh, what if there's been a release of an extremely hazardous substance within a half mile of a school? What do you, the agency, have to do? You have to call the school district superintendent and let them know. That needs to be part of your area plan. I would suggest you practice that. I would suggest you coordinate with the school district and the superintendent, because generally, who are you going to get when you call the schools? And I know this because my wife was the risk management director for a big school district, and I'd hear harp on this all the time. You get the secretary, yeah, or the assistant. I don't know what this is, and they file the message away. It's like, no, it's an emergency reporting. I need to get to this person right away. 
well, they're in a conference. Well, get, practice it, right? Because it, sometimes it's important for the school to know. Uh, Air District has to notify you, the Koopa, if there's a release that poses a threat within, a, within basically within a quarter mile of the school, and then the facility would be reporting that to AQMD. So again, just be aware that there may be reports coming from not the facility. Uh, pretty much any time you, the agency, respond to a spill, not a bad idea to check in with the Calima Warning Center to see if it's been reported so there aren't multiple reports that are filed. Uh, it's hit federal reporting. Uh, this is perhaps the coolest logo in all the federal world. This is actually scratch and sniff. <laughs> Don't do this one. You have the radio, well, as long as you're far enough away. All right. In the federal world, right, there's four big primary statutes that, 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 that address spill and release reporting as part of the other requirements. There's Superfund, Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation Liability Act. There's EPCRA, the Emergency Planning Community Right to Know Act, Clean Water Act, and the Hazardous Materials Transportation Act. Going into the first one, and we'll, we'll talk about the, these definitions in a second. A release of a Superfund-listed hazardous substance, and there's a certain list of them, Right? Over its reportable quantity that goes into the environment, that's reported to the National Response Center. Right? Specific list of chemicals and compounds. Uh, how about oils? Are oils a Superfund hazardous substance? They are not. Right? How about under the Emergency Planning Community Right to Know Act, right, or EPCRA? An extremely hazardous substance released over its reportable quantity. Different list, different chemicals, different reportable quantity. That's reportable to the State Emergency Response Commission or the Local Emergency Planning Committee. Hey, who is that here in California? That's you, the COOPA, or the participating agency. Right, if you try and call the State Emergency Response Commission, good luck with that. You know, you call the LEPC, depending on what regional LEPC you call. It's like, why are you calling me? Call, call your COOPA. Right, so that's what that is. Or, under EPCRA, if it's a circular listed hazardous substance that's been released over its reportable quantity and results in a threat to the public outside the facility, that's also reportable. But again, reportable to the COOPA, like any other hazmat re release report to the, to the local agency. Clean Water Act, right? Is, are oils a Clean Water Act regulated material? Oh, yeah. Right? So a release uh, of a circular hazardous substance over its RQ or oil that gets into a navigable waterway, causes a sheen upon the water, deposits a sludge upon the shoreline, right? That's reportable to the National Response Center. How much oil does it take to cause a sheen? Not a lot, a drop. Some of you people rub your hand through your hair going, oh, thank God I don't have to report, and you touch the shoreline. <laughs> ah, crap. You know, and you have to report. Hazardous Material Transportation Act. A release of a DOT regulated hazardous material during the course of transportation that causes death, injury, public evacuation, or highway uh, closure more than an hour. That's reported to, to the Department of Transportation through the National Response Center. Right? Those are the four big ones. There's a bunch of others, but keep in mind they're fairly conditional. In some cases, broad conditions, other cases, they're narrow. All right? But just like California determination, you need to have some critical thinking. Not everything is reportable. Now, you may have a policy at your facility that you are going to report everything, and that's fine, right? But again, if you're going to decide that something's not going to be reportable, you kind of need to figure this stuff out. Is it on a hazardous material or hazardous substance list? What is the reportable quantity? How much has actually been released in pounds? Did it, gum, did it come from a regulated source? Did it go into a regulated destination? over what period of time, all right? So these are some of the considerations that, you, that, that, that need to be determined, right? Before you can figure out, no, it's not federally reportable, right? And, and you know, if anything spills anywhere inside your facility, that's captured under Superfund, right? So the vendor truck that has a spill while they're hooked up to the tanks and they're loading or they're offloading drums, boom, that spills. That's potentially a circle of regulated spill, even though it happened within your plant boundaries. Then the question is, okay, did it go into the environment? Is it over the reportable quantity? Right? If it's driving down, you know, even driving down the road, 
that may still kick you into Superfund reporting. So for you companies who do hazmat transportation, it may not be just to DOT that's reportable. It could also be under Superfund if you're under to the National Response Center if you're over the reportable quantity for a release, right? Uh, you know, Clean Water Act, you don't just have to be on the water. Some facility out in the desert that has a release into the Mojave River, which sees water maybe, what, once or twice a year? Is that a release potential into the navigable waterway? Yeah, it is. Uh, there, there, there is, and just to mention it, there is an exemption under Superfund. If that release results only or solely in exposure to basically to employees or plant personnel, that's a very narrow cir circular Superfund exemption. I really wouldn't rely on that. You know, if you only gas out your employees and you're thinking, oh, thank God, I don't have to report to the National Response Center. Who else do you have to call? Well, all the California reporting, probably OSHA. Is the NRC going to find out about it? Yeah, you know, report it. Okay, Clean Water Act, you could have all kinds, and we do this in the APSA class, there's all kinds of discussions that you can have. Is it a navigable waterway? Is it not? Is it, you know, is there a hydraulic nexus to the navigable water? Well, it just went into a dry creek or it went into the storm drain. Hey, here in California, anything hits the storm drain, it's pretty much going to be a navigable water release. You know, and, and to make the decision that it's not, I would rely on lawyers to tell me otherwise. Because it, it's a whole, it, it's just an in-depth legal discussion as to whether it is or isn't. And lacking that guidance, anything hits a storm drain, I'm reporting it as a Clean Water Act spill. Or, or a spill into the environment. All right, so into the environment, it kind of depends. You have a release into secondary containment, into the side of the double-walled tank, is that a release into the environment? No. You have a release that gets out and into the dirt weed area? Yes. Gets into the secondary containment that's designed to hold it? Not necessarily into the environment. It gets out of that design secondary containment? That is into the environment. Kind of depends where it is. All right. Uh, this is the same as California, which means it's not just about the reportable quantities. It could be situation-based. Take a look at your permits. A lot of permits require reporting of things or documentation and not emergency reporting, but other reporting to an agency. So facilities really need to read through their permits to see what they're required to report and what those reporting time frames are. Uh, the federal reportable quantity scheme, it's primarily quantitative. It is primarily uh, pound-based, one pound, 10 pound, 100 pound, 1,000 pound, 5,000 pound. You really need to be able to convert percent of an ingredient in a liquid to pounds of that chemical. Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's tough. What if it's just off-gassing? How many pounds is that? I don't know. It's no pounds, otherwise it wouldn't float away. I, <laughs> I read some reports somewhere that, you know, you know, like some big rain cloud, well, there's 350,000 tons of water in that cloud. Oh my God, bullshit. It's up in the air. I don't know how planes work. But I fly in them. Yeah. Not the dream ladder, of course, but other places. Anyway, so, there, so most of these are, and you know, they're calculated for a 24 hour period. Don't wait 24 hours. You know, if you know, look, it's going to hit that RQ before it gets out in 24 hours, you need to report. And remember, there's all different kinds of lists. You can get on EPA's website, on, the, on their emergency response website, you can download the list of lists. There's phone, there's smartphone apps for the list of lists that you can get, right? So you look at some of these and like for example, for chlorine, the extremely hazardous substance, reportable quantity, 10 pounds under Superfund, it's also 10 pounds. Under the Clean Air Act, it's 2,500 pounds. You know, report to the lowest reportable quantity. Kind of depends, depends on what it is. Don't forget, you may have two individual chemicals that get released. They may not be individually reportable, but when they mix, you have a reaction product. That reaction product could very well be reportable. So keep that in mind as well. So you have a tank with nitric acid in it. Reportable quantity of that nitric acid is 1,000 pounds. There's a crack in the tank. 
and you're off-gassing nitric oxide or, nit you know, the BFRC, the big red cloud, that reportable quantity is 10 pounds, right? So the byproduct, the reaction product is reportable. Sodium hypochlorite, 100-pound RQ, ferric chloride, 1,000-pound RQ, they mix together, you're cooking off a little bit of chlorine, that's a 10-pound RQ. All right, so get information about the, re about the release response. And probably, if you have a crack in your nitric acid tank, are you going to report that anyway? Yes. Yeah, you know. Well, we need to calculate. No, no, not right away. All right, so different scenarios, uh, um, you know, particularly for PCBs, it depends on what they hit. We don't have time to go through the detail. But sometimes they are scenario dependent. Do they stay in the equipment? Do they leak into the ground? Do they get out of containment? Is it a huge oil spill out of containment? In addition to the uh, Clean Water Act reporting, you may have to send a note to EPA that says, hi, my SBCC plan's not working. Will you please show up and tell me what I need to do and how much I need to pay? And then Pete comes out and he'll tell you, right? Who has to report? Well, the short answer is who doesn't have to report, and that's me, right? Your intrepid outside consultant who's here to help you in any way that he can in a cost-effective fashion. But if you hire me to, to actually operate something, one, big mistake. Secondly, if you do, then I do have operational responsibility. I may have a reporting obligation, right? Everybody's gone for the long weekend. You have your outside third-party security company in, right? And they're manning the gate. They have a reporting obligation because they're in control of the facility. So you want to make sure that the training and the procedures are commensurate with that. Right, but somebody has to report. All right, so you want to have some procedures in charge and so forth. Again, federally, pretty much right away. There, there's even a federal matrix. How many percent over the RQ by how many minutes over 15? Hey, look, there's a penalty. Right? Don't dawdle. At least initially get it reported and then call back with updates. But at least stop that clock from running. Don't wait. Well, we finally figured out after three weeks of consultation that it was reportable. Not the best thing you can do, right? And again, you call the National Response Center. Uh, for those of you iPadable, right? You can even do this online, right? And there's all kinds of online reporting forms that you can use if you don't want to pick up the phone, right? You can go to the National Response Center website. You can play with this. There's all kinds of drill reports that you can file. And if you do, you really want to make sure you hit the drill report <laughs> the right way or you're going to be on CNN. <laughs> All right, uh, written follow-up reporting under Section 304 of, of the Emergency Planning Community Right to Know Act. If it is reportable under EPCRA, meaning it poses a threat to the community, or it's over the EPCRA, extremely hazardous substance RQ, federally there is a written report that, that's required. A lot of COOPAs tell their, tell their facilities, that, and that's the form, that this form has to be completed for every spill. That's not accurate unless you have that in your local ordinance. You can ask for it, and that's fine, but it's not a requirement. This is only for federal extremely hazardous substance releases. That being said, you, the COOPA, can still ask for a written documentation of that release. You want it on the form, fine. You don't, that's fine too. All right, because I know we're, we're getting close to running out of time. Transportation. Now, for those of you who, who have you know, vendors coming in, you know, whether it's UPS, FedEx, you know, the bulk chemical vendors, whoever, they bring stuff on site, or for you folks who are involved in transportation, there's two basic types of transportation incident reporting. The first one, the carrier. Who's the carrier? There's Terry Carrier from Orange County Healthcare. And then there's all the drivers and the vendors that are driving stuff around. Those are the carriers. You have Univar deliver a chemical to you, Univar is the carrier. FedEx is the carrier. Union Pacific is the carrier, right? So the carrier has to report within 30 days to DOT, and that's a written report on a specific detailed DOT form, the form, what, 5200.1, of certain incidents that occurred during the course of transportation. Now, during the course of transportation, driving over the road, riding on the rails, obviously, how about temporary parking? Yep. How about loading and unloading at your facility? Yep. That is still during the course of transportation. So they have to report unintentional releases of hazardous materials or hazardous waste. What's the reportable quantity? There isn't one. 
So they show up at the port, open up the back hatch, drip, 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 that's reportable. The only exceptions are if it's you know, the proper shipping name, if it's a consumer commodity, certain types of batteries, paint-related materials, five gallons and less, and uh, packaging, five gallons or less, certain packaging group threes. Basically, it, the low hazard stuff is not necessarily reportable, all right? Uh, if they just have a little release while they're connecting and disconnecting lines, and typically, you know, they'll put the bucket under it, doesn't result in property damage, that's not reportable. What is not exempt, essentially anything that happens during aircraft transport, and those happen all the time, right? Value jet crashed into the glades, killed 111 people. That's a hazardous materials incident, right? The oxygen generators that were packaged and shipped improperly. Uh, 49 CFR 171.15 reportables, essentially those are holy crap incidents. Those are the really high hazard, you know, get the hell out of the area kind of reportable. And most anything that's in packaging group one, if you're familiar with DOT requirements, what's a packaging group one? What kind of compounds are those? The, the, the bad stuff, right? P -p packaging group one are the really strong containers. How do you know it's in a packaging group one versus two versus three? Should be on the shipping papers, on the bill of lading or on the manifest or the way bill, right? Uh, and any hazardous waste release. Any hazardous waste release? How many of you guys have had hazardous waste vendors? Work at the facility and they've got a little bit of a spill. DOT reportable. You want to make sure they follow their legal obligation and get a copy of that report. And if they look at you like, huh? They give you the Scooby look, you may need to use a different vendor who knows what they're doing. All right, second type of reportable. The person in physical possession of that hazardous <laughs> material. So uh, the hazardous material vendor shows up, they have a bunch of drums in the, tr in the, in the back of the stake bed. You don't want them driving your forklift. You, the facility, have your forklift person forklift out that pallet, drum falls off. You are in physical possession of that hazardous material. So in addition to the carrier having a, a reporting obligation, perhaps, you, the facility, may also have a reporting obligation under DOT rules because you're in physical possession. And this is conditional, death or hospitalization due to that hazardous materials release. So the drum falls off the truck, cracks open, soaks somebody down, I'm melting, right? That's DOT reportable by you, the handler, or the, you, the person in physical possession. Drum falls off the truck, whacks somebody in the head, they drop down dead, drum does not open. That's not due to the hazardous material release itself. Woohoo! All these other conditions, right? But you decide, well, we gotta block the street anyway. Ah, damn, now it's reportable. So if you're handling hazardous materials from vehicles or from rail cars or from vessels, you need to be aware of these reporting requirements because this is in addition to the National Response Center reporting. This is different from California reporting. This is reporting. Basically, you're reporting to DOT through the National Response Center within 12 hours. And there's a written report follow-up. So you need to be familiar with that written report. You can go to... Uh, uh, God, they change the website all the time. I, I think you can go to hazmat.dot.gov or do a search. Uh, do a search for DOT hazmat reporting, and there's a whole guidance document and, and set of forms that you can fill out. Uh, re remember, it's not just when you release something in transportation. What if you get an undeclared shipment? You know, box shows up, open it up. Ah, there's a human head. Okay, that goes to Department C. Right? You open up another box, ah, crap, there's acid in here. No shipping papers, no labeling, no marking. That's an undeclared hazardous material shipment. That's reportable to DOT. Not as a release response, but that's also reportable within 30 days. Why do you think DOT wants to know about that? They, P, DOT has no sense of humor when it comes to hazmat transportation problems. Because otherwise you get things like, I don't know, value jet falling out of the sky, undeclared hazardous material shipment, right? And if, they, if those things didn't cook off in the plane and that plane landed and the people did their right job when they received it, they said, hey, these weren't declared. They would have reported to DOT if they did their job right and DOT would have jumped all over value jet for that. Could have prevented 110 people from being killed next time. 
right? So it is important, right? But you want your shipping people or your receiving people to be aware of this if they receive hazardous materials. And they should be trained in, are they DOT hazardous material handlers or hazmat employees under DOT requirements? Yes, they are. They need triennial training, right? So there's all kinds of stuff. Okay, don't forget about the locals. You know, they may have their own reporting requirements. Even if they're guidance, you don't want to hack off your local agency. If they say, look, you're a caliber facility. We want to know when anything untoward happens, even if it's not regularly reportable. Ask about that. Find out about what the locals do require reporting. And, and, and my happy tips are a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about. You know, basically, you're going to need to prove a negative. No, it didn't pose a threat. Why not? At least have something besides what you make up on the spot. You know, have something that reasonable people can discuss. My opinion is when in doubt, report. Because what's the worst that'll happen? Nothing, really. You know, be accurate in your report. Uh, you know, the potential, you know, oh, they're calling up and reporting again. Much better than, oh, they're not reporting what they should have. Right? You're going to engender more trust. And, and if you keep reporting stuff, even if it's not really reportable, but you're reporting all the time, that's a bigger issue. You know, that, that's an issue with your emergency management system or your environmental management system. You know, there's a reason why you keep having all these little spills. And the reporting aspect is not your bigger problem. Your, report, your problem is, why are we having all these little incidents? What, what, what are we failing to do? Do some root cause review for that, right? Find out why did it happen? How do we prevent it from happening again? How do we keep it smaller? What it used to be, if you guys want to get a sticker for your shredder that says customer suggestion box, www.despair.com. They're like 10 bucks. I got a ton of them. All right. If you, you know, plan to be prepared and respond appropriately, including your reporting and your reporting determination. And if you do decide not to report, fine. What kind of documentation do you have? Why don't you think it was reportable? Whatever your reasoning is. Again, reasonable people can disagree, but at least you have something. And you said, look, I work with this material all the time. Here's the material safety data sheet. It's not really going to work. I just handle this all the time. It went into containment. You know, we were prepared for this. You know, be aware and sensitive to local concerns and perceptions. Uh, one of my, this is years ago. One of my client facilities, big oil field. There's the beach, beautiful ocean, gorgeous beach, a highway, an oil field, and $3 million houses. <laughs> 10 years ago, $3 million houses, right? These people really don't want that oil strip to be there. So they're looking for any excuse, right? So uh, guy's up on one of the tanks painting the tank, falls off the ladder, breaks his leg, right? Little bit of paint spills. <laughs> Happened to be red paint, still. No real hazmat release, right? Ah, oh, they call the ambulance for the guy. The people in the houses with their binoculars are looking, oh my God, you know, that tank is releasing because you know, the tanks are kind of rusty, right? They've had a hazmat release, so they call the fire department. Fire department's like, well, they didn't report a hazardous materials release. Well, we can never trust them. They never report anything, right? So they send the whole hazmat crew out to respond. Meanwhile, this guy is down here getting splinted up with the ambulance, and he's looking around and saying, why are the hazmat guys here? You know, and all it does is engender distrust among everybody. The next time, perhaps the facility would be aware because they're being looked at all the time. Somebody falls off the ladder, call the fire department, say, hey, you know, Fred fell off the ladder again. He broke his other leg this time. Everything's fine. Call the ambulance, send them to the hospital, get them a walker. Everything's fine. So if you get a call, that's what happened. Or we spilled a little bit of oil. No big deal, happens all the time, we're cleaning it up, just so you know in case you get a call. Be aware to local, you know, just be aware of what's going on around you. Who needs to be called first? If you ask you agencies, who needs to be called first? I do, right, all the agencies, everyone wants to be called first. My opinion is, report to the closest location of impact first. If it went in the stormwater hole, call the stormwater guys. If it went in the wastewater hole, call the wastewater guys. Then call your locals. Then call the state. Then call the feds. Everybody you didn't call first is going to get hacked off. Too bad. While you're on the horn with the state, 
it's whacking out a couple of wastewater workers. Rep my opinion is report, you could always defend that, right? And it shouldn't take you more than five, 10 minutes anyway. And don't dally, report right away. Assume written reports are required, so keep some notes and document what happens so you don't have to try and make stuff up. Be aware there may be some immediate post reporting requirements such as emptying a tank, testing a tank, cleaning the area, you know, sending somebody to the hospital. If you send someone to the hospital, if they got hurt, you may have some OSHA follow up that you have to do. Figure out all these issues now. Don't wait till you have a spill, right? Just kind of figure it out. Try and get lower hazard chemicals. Use secondary containment. Keep your problem as small as you can. Have some written procedures and practice them so that perhaps you don't have as many spills, right? Lower your volumes, practice prevention. You know, a little planning does go a long way. You know, if you're, <laughs> maybe you should have parked your plane like 10 feet over, right? The, you can, and you can fix this with duct tape. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, you, you know, if, if you're in, in your facility, if you may need legal concurrence for a lot of what we're talking about, don't wait till Friday, 3 o'clock in the morning. You know, work with your legal department now. Work with your outside counsel now. Say, look, you know, we were in this class, and here's what they said, on, 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 on. What do you think? And get these issues addressed. You know, that way you don't have to worry about it. Have some procedures. Make sure you have alternates. You know, stuff like that. Uh, here's a copy. I didn't give anybody a copy of this. You can download this. Now, a lot of agencies have this posted on their website. The latest one is August 2010, last time I checked. There are a lot that are earlier on people's website. Don't have any earlier than August 2010. So I have the good one. Uh, here's to, and you can look at this on the full page. So I didn't provide pages for this in the handouts because I don't like other consultants copying my stuff and charging for it. But you know, you're, you're welcome to take a look at it. This is a redacted version of an example guidance that we did for one of our clients. It said, all right, look, you know, the, the, the control room guys, you know, you, you can go through this. You can see what we think is reportable and how to do it. We have specific compound. This is just something we did. Right? You don't have to do this, but it's just, it's just one example, right? Whether it's reportable or not federally. Uh, questions, comments, additions, deletions, corrections. Did, did you guys get value out of what we did this morning? Do you think it was helpful? Do you have any questions? Do you have any, yes? Well, if it's not if it's not an emergency, you don't need to call 911. Okay, just like the normal reason yeah. to call 911. Yeah. Yeah. If you have any detailed questions, you want the legal basis. You want to find out what your liabilities are. Tuesday afternoon, Gary Luck is doing a 4-hour session. He's scheduled for a 4-hour session. There's Gary right there. I've never met the man, but I looked at his bio and he's more qualified than me, so there you go. And he's wearing a suit. So, Oh, you are? Okay, well, never mind. You, do you have any idea what you could have charged until they show up tomorrow and go, my God, Gary's six foot eight with the, with, you know, any, you know. Anyway, so there's a lot of detailed stuff going on Tuesday afternoon. Gary's an attorney going through spill and release liabilities. Yes. With the IE. Oh, industrial environment. I, Sylvia, I never got the handouts. Okay. Sylvia Marson from the Industrial Environmental Coalition of Orange County. For your Orange County-based people, uh, we're going to put a bunch of these up at one of the tables up there and hand them out. A great organization for you folks in Orange County to participate in and join uh, uh, bi-monthly lunch meetings with regulatory agencies. It's designed for the operational facility and you facility folks, although anybody is open to join. Uh, organization's been around for, what, 12 years, 13 years? Great organization. I encourage you to take a brochure and look into joining. It's fabulous, and it's worth every nickel, and it's not a lot of nickels. Make sure you do your evaluations, and you could do them online on your smartphone. Uh, I think everybody got a copy of the handout. You can download it. Everything's fine. Right? 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 Is that it? Is that it? Is that it? Get out.